Uh, next section, uh, did the University of Virginia have chaplains? The modern claim that the University of Virginia had no chaplains is also easily disproved by original documents, including early newspaper ads that the university ran to recruit students from surrounding areas. Oh, oh yeah, early newspaper ads. Okay, the early newspaper ads are not early, meaning when Jefferson was there. The early meaning like the 1840s. So I'm going to assume here, I haven't read this yet, but that Barton gives no dates. So, let's see. Well, so let, let, let's take this one here uh, uh, where, where he's actually got a footnote, okay, that says religious services are regularly performed at the university by a chaplain who is appointed in turn from the four principal denominations of the state and by a resolution of the faculty, ministers of the gospel and young men preparing for the ministry may attend any of the schools without the payment of fees to the professors. Okay, we're going to look up Barton's footnote here. I believe this is from the uh, 1840s. Yeah, it's a University of Virginia advertisement uh, from 1843. So this is after Jefferson was gone, after Madison was gone, at the time when there were people uh, trying to uh, bring religion into the university, which we'll get to here. Um, he says that the university only didn't have chaplains in its first three years. Um, oh, because, because the university was establishing its reputation as a trans-denominational university. Uh, actually, the first chaplain was hired by um, a group of students, and that was... Uh, when James Madison was the rector, yeah, because that would have been right after Jefferson died. I gotta find this in my book here. In 1829, a chaplain was hired with private contributions. This was the first chaplain. Okay, so um, where Barton says the university did indeed have chaplains, albeit not for its first three years, okay, what we're talking about here is when they did get a chaplain, it was hired with private contributions. But then, okay, uh, that only lasted like that year because a lack of contributions from 1830 to 1833 made it impossible for them to have enough money to have for these private contributors to come up with enough money to hire a chaplain. Uh, at this time, chaplains were not permitted to live on the university campus. Uh, that was one of Jefferson, Madison, the chaplain, even when the chaplain was hired with these private contributions and they had a chaplain, that chaplain was not allowed to live on the campus. So that meant that the people, the students, faculty, whoever was kicking in to hire themselves a chaplain also had to be able to support that chaplain's living expenses off campus. Uh, and then during the 1832-1833 school year, it was a student. And again, Madison's thing that was right in line with current law of what's allowed in public schools, a student uh, named McClurg Wickman, Wickham, uh, took charge and organized a group of about 30 students, all of whom signed a pledge that between them they would contribute enough money to pay the salary of a chaplain. Wickham's plan was approved by the chairman of the faculty and presented to the Board of Visitors, who approved it at their July 1833 meeting. Uh, and he quotes Madison here, saying that permanent provision for religious instruction and observance among the students would be made by, and there's an ellipsis, services of clergymen. Okay, you got Barton, you got an ellipsis, quoting Madison. I gotta look this up. Um, that, and it's bear with me because this is in Madison's handwriting and it's kind of faint. Um, uh, so Madison say, I have indulged more particularly the hope that, and this is where Barton starts his quote, that provision, and the word permanence not in the Madison's letter, that provision for religious instruction and observances among the students, oh wait, I mean, I have this quote in my book, I don't have to decipher it again. Well, ain't this special? 
Uh, what, what Barton is uh, uh, quoting here, where he says that Madison announced that permanent, and permanent is Barton's word inserted in brackets, that permanent provision for religious instruction and observance among the students would be made by, and then there's an ellipsis, services of clergymen. That's from the, the letter I already quoted, where Madison was saying that he wanted the clergymen, the chaplains, to be hired by the students or their parents. Okay, so, so here's what, what Barton lops out of that quote there to make it say what he wants it to say. Okay, I'm going to get the, uh, to that part of the quote. That provision, and Barton sticks the word permanent in, in there before provision in brackets, I guess, to make it look like this was something that did happen and went on. Um, that provision for religious instruction, this is from the real quote, that religious instruction and observance among the students would be made by, okay, that's where Barton stops and has his ellipsis. This is what the real quote continues with. Made by themselves or their parents and guardians, each contributing to a fund to be applied in remunerating the services of a clergyman. And Barton only puts services of a clergyman. He cuts out that whole part that it would be the students themselves or their parents and guardians would be contributing to have this chaplain. So in Barton's version, it looks like Madison made an announcement. It wasn't, it was just in a letter to Chapman Johnson. Madison announced that they were going to have chaplains, and obviously that is edited to make it look like Madison was going to have the university hire permanent chaplains. That is not what the real quote says. Where the hell is my stress rocket? Okay, and then Barton's conclusion from his misquote of what Madison's letter said is, the university Therefore, extended official recognition to one primary chaplain for all the students, with the chaplain position rotating annually among the major denominations that Jefferson identified as the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians, and Anglicans. And of course, Jeff Jefferson's dead at this point, so he's not identifying anything. Um, in 1829, Presbyterian clergyman Reverend Edward Smith became the first chaplain at the University of Virginia. It was an official university position, but unpaid. No. It was a chaplain hired by the students. And it only lasted a year. Uh, and then he jumps right to 1833, and as I said before, from 1830 to 1833, there was no chaplains because the students couldn't cough up enough money. So Barton, the way he words it here, it makes it look like that first chaplain was there from 1829 to 1833. By just beginning the next sentence, in 1833, after three-fourths of the students pledged their own money for the chaplain's support, and again, I mean, I don't know if it was three-fourths or not, I'm not even going to bother checking that, but that was that... Uh, McClurg, Wickham, uh, getting a uh, student led, getting students to pledge the money, okay, and he goes into what uh, what chaplain was hired at that time, and that he became the first paid chaplain again, implying that he was being paid by the university. Nowhere in any of this does Barton say that the rule was that the students raised the money to hire their chaplain, okay, nowhere. This is all, in Barton's book, an official university position chaplain. Okay, and then he jumps to 1855. The university built a parsonage to provide a residence for the university chaplain. Because as I said before, they, under Madison and Jefferson and up until 1855, uh, um, the chaplain was not allowed to live on the campus. Uh, I believe there was a battle over that in, 18, in the 1840s, but I'm not, I'm not even going to get into that because... I think you get the idea here. Um, and then he lists a bunch of chaplains who were chaplains there. But again, this is three decades now we're talking after Jefferson. Okay, so another one of Barton's conclusions. In short, first-hand source documents, especially Jefferson's own writings, incontestably refute all four modern assertions about the alleged 
secular nature of the University of Virginia. If anyone examines the original sources and claims otherwise, they are, to use the words of early military chaplain William Baderwolf, just as likely to, quote, look all over the sky at high noon on a cloudless day and not see the sun. I just want to end with what is probably the most indisputable proof that Jefferson did, in fact, found a secular university. And that would be that in the 1840s, the Presbyterian clergy decided that they now had the opportunity, with Madison and Jefferson gone, to introduce religious education into the university. Now, if there had been religious education in the university before this, when Jefferson was there, when Madison was there, why in the 1840s did the clergy think religious education needed to be introduced into the university? Uh, I'm just going to read a few uh, quotes from the Presbyterian clergy of the 1840s. Uh, this is uh, James uh, Alexander, a prominent Presbyterian minister, and uh, he was writing back and forth with another Presbyterian minister named John Hall. It starts in 1840, when it was beginning to look like a religious takeover of the university might be possible. James Alexander wrote this to John Hall. The religious prospects of the University of Virginia are really encouraging. It seems as if Providence was throwing contempt on old Jefferson's ashes. In another letter to Hall, after visiting the university seven years later, Alexander wrote, Jefferson knew how to select one of the finest plateaus in the land for this college. His anti-Christian plans have been singularly thwarted in every way. For example, here is a chapel since I was here last. And by the way, the chapel wasn't the chapel that's there now. That wasn't built until like the uh, 1870s, 1880s. When he says chapel, what he's talking about was the religious services in the uh, rotunda. Three professors are communicants, besides Dr. McGuffey, who was a Presbyterian minister. So this is all, this is after, um, uh, you know, 1845, when McGuffey uh, replaced the original ethics professor, George Tucker. Okay, he goes on. I shall not be surprised if, before ten years, this rich and central institution should have on its very grounds a Presbyterian theological school as the law founding the university gives leave to any Christian sect to build and to have a theological professor with freedom of library apparatus, etc. And now, as I said, the, the chapel wasn't really a chapel, it was just a room uh, in the rotunda as of 1841. Again, after Madison was, was gone, uh, there was a room actually designated for religious worship, okay? So, uh, this Reverend Alexander didn't seem to think that that was uh, uh, that significant of an improvement. In 1842, he wrote in the Southern Literary Messenger, uh, in the university, the services are performed in the lecture room, which is very inconveniently arranged and where the mind is diverted by a thousand perceptions and associations. Everything in connection with the spirituelle of that institution would show, if we did not know the fact, that the introduction of religion was an afterthought. In all her extensive arrangements, there is not a single accommodation for religion. So don't take my word for it. Take the word of 1840s minister James Alexander.